Hi there. Welcome to this month's business briefings. I'm Katya Popova. I'm the Director of Communications at the Kogat School of Business. And today, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Professor Kara Fisher. Professor Fisher has an incredible amount of experience in tax, and especially international taxation. And it's April. It is kind of a peak season for tax. So we thought it would be a really nice time for us to sit down and celebrate and appreciate the topic of tax. It's a complex topic, but before we dive into that complexity, I actually wanted to touch a little bit on Professor Fisher's background. She's had an incredible experience, um, now in academia as well, but she's had stints in Congress. She's uh, had some amazing projects, such as working on the Enron investigation. She spent a whole year in the UK working for PwC, and I'm curious to learn a little bit about how have these varied experiences colored your perspective on tax and, and just your thoughts on it in general? Sure. So as you mentioned, I started my career with PricewaterhouseCoopers in the national tax practice here in Washington, D.C., and I immediately specialized in international tax. Mm -hmm. And that led to an opportunity to go abroad and work in PwC's London office. And while I was in the United Kingdom, I was exposed to all different tax systems across the European Union. Mm -hmm. And it was here that I had the opportunity to see how different countries tax their citizens, and in turn, how different countries are defining fairness and taxation. And I became fascinated by this, and that's really what stimulated my interest in tax policy. So when my international assignment was over and I returned home to the United States, I took a job with the Joint Committee on Taxation and that is the tax committee of the U.S. Congress involved in the tax policy debate. And I spent several years there, worked on um, a diversity of projects, and then recently transitioned into academia where I have continued my passion for tax policy, teaching tax policy and international tax, and also here at AU Financial Accounting. We are very passionate about tax at COGA, that's for sure. Now, you did mention something that I wanted to, to bring up again, Joint Committee on Taxation. So not a very widely known term. Tell us a little bit more about it, because I think that people should know how important it is for tax policy, uh, and yet it's so not famous. Exactly. So the Joint Committee on Taxation is a little known committee that has a very big role in the tax legislative process. And this committee is nonpartisan. Its staff is comprised of economists, accountants, and attorneys. And they are, for lack of a better term, the technical gurus that see a tax bill from start to finish with respect to Congress. And they work primarily with the two tax writing committees. So mm -hmm. on the House side, that's going to be the House Ways and Means Committee. Yes. On the Senate side, it's going to be the Senate Finance Committee. And they're going to see those bills through committee, onto the floor, and then ultimately through the conference process, which mm -hmm. is where the House and Senate have to agree to a bill yeah. that ultimately makes its way to the President's desk. And then from time to time, the committee gets asked to do special reports, yeah. as was the case whenever I was with the committee. Yeah. And probably the most notable at that time was the Enron investigation, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, the Senate Finance Committee commissioned the Joint Committee on Taxation to investigate Enron, and more specifically, the extent to which the tax shelters that they had engaged in contributed to their bankruptcy. Yeah. And this resulted in a report from the Joint Committee mm -hmm. to the policymakers in Congress yeah. with policy recommendations for how to curb tax shelter abuse. And what was really fulfilling for our committee was during the time we were there, mm -hmm. these policy recommendations were adopted by Congress in the American Jobs Creation Act of 2004 mm -hmm. and became law. So they are now part of our Internal Revenue Code. How rewarding. Huh? So let's talk about policymaking. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things that go into consideration when it comes to enacting tax laws, what would you say are the things that policymakers typically considering in uh, enacting tax law? Sure. So most of our taxes fall into two different categories. We mm -hmm. have income taxes and we mm -hmm. have consumption taxes. Yeah. And policymakers are going to consider two different principles with respect to these two different types of taxes. Mm -hmm. So with respect to income taxes, we are focused on the ability to pay principle. And this says that our overall income tax burden mm -hmm. should be distributed in a way that matches an individual's ability to pay. Mm -hmm. So as your income increases, you have the capacity to bear a larger tax burden. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you see our marginal tax rates increase with income. Okay. Now, in contrast to this, we have consumption taxes. And usually these are imposed at the state and local levels. And these are sales taxes on your goods and services that you're consuming on a regular basis. Yeah. 
and these consumption taxes are going to attach to the benefits received principle. So a completely different principle here, and it looks to the direct benefit that you receive from the good or service, and it says you will be taxed appropriately. Mm -hmm. And the example I like to use here is if you walk into Target and you purchase a pair of shoes, you are usually going to have a state sales tax that attaches to that pair of shoes, and it's going to be the same for you and everyone else behind you in line. So the cashier is not going to ask how much income you make before ringing you up at the register. Everyone is going to pay the same percentage of tax. So benefits received with respect to consumption tax, ability to pay when it comes to income taxes. And we'll go back to that topic a little bit later on in our conversation. But uh, before we go there, so taxes in economy, so oftentimes interlinked, oftentimes even interchanged in the commentary. Uh, what is the difference between fiscal policy and monetary policy? Because I think those two play a very important role in overall economy and health of the economy, right? Absolutely. Both policies can influence the economy. Yeah. So monetary policy is tied to the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. And many of our viewers are probably familiar with this because this is where the Federal Reserve will adjust interest rates to influence the economy. Yeah. So for example, in a recession, yeah. the Federal Reserve may lower interest rates to try to stimulate investment by consumers and businesses by lowering the cost of borrowing. Yeah. And then the opposite is fiscal policy. And this is where Congress takes action. And if we are in a recession, Congress could lower the tax rates or they could increase government spending and both would be a way to stimulate the economy. Now, these are distinctly different actions mm -hmm. in that fiscal policy is usually more permanent and mm -hmm. it's hard to reverse. Mm -hmm. So tax law? very difficult to change and adjust, John, right? Correct. Interesting. Um, so going back and understanding that our audience is probably rushing to get their taxes done by now, I hope. And um, I want to talk a little bit more about our tax system in the U.S. So oftentimes we hear the criticism that it's a little bit too complicated. Um, it's a little bit burdensome. I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So at this time of year, I think we hear a lot of people complaining that the tax code is too complex. Yep. And what's interesting is many of the complexities in our tax code are justified in the name of fairness. So if we take a step back for a moment and we say, what is the simplest tax system that we could impose? Right. It would be one where we say every household pays the same amount of tax regardless of income. Right. So for example, we could say every household in the United States will pay $2,000 worth of tax each year regardless of earnings. Yeah. Now, many would argue this is unfair. Right. And so that really becomes the challenge for policymakers is how do you balance fairness with simplicity? Yeah. And usually when we define fairness in terms of taxation, it's done across three different definitions of equity. Yeah. And the first is vertical equity. Yeah. And this is tied to the ability to pay principle that we discussed earlier. Right. Vertical equity says that as income increases, so should your tax burden. Right. The other kind of equity is horizontal equity, which says treat equals equal and impose the same tax burden on households that are equally well off. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to this in just a moment. Right. The third type of equity is transitional equity. And this recognizes that anytime our tax law changes, it's going to create winners and losers. And there's going to be people that are worse off, even if we're moving to a better tax system overall. Mm -hmm. So how do we ease that transition and how do we make that more equitable for yeah. those taxpayers who are going to be worse off under the new rules? So those are the three different types of equity with respect to defining fairness and taxation. Yeah. But I'd like to come back to horizontal equity because I think this is going to be interesting for our viewers with respect to how exacting fairness in the tax code also creates complexity. So let's say that we have two households, mm -hmm. household A and household B. Mm -hmm both earn $80,000 of income. Mm -hmm. From a horizontal equity standpoint, we wanna make sure that both of those households that are equally situated pay a similar amount of tax. Mm -hmm. Now what we learn about household A is one of the members is terminally ill mm -hmm. and there are unavoidable medical expenses, mm -hmm. significant medical expenses. Mm -hmm. And so to exact fairness, the tax code says, okay, if you have eligible medical expenses that are significant, yeah. you can deduct those expenses against your overall tax liability. Right. So we've just provided a tax preference to household A. Yeah. Now what we've done at the same time in trying to be fair is add complexity to the code. And the reason is we now have to define what are eligible medical expenses 
and what is a significant level of medical expenses. Yeah. So we have to add new rules and regulations just to exact fairness with respect to this one area of medical expenses. And as we've talked, um, this is also sometimes used for social um, fairness and social incentives, right? Um, some examples might include having children or buying a house where the government can incentivize this behavior. Can you comment a little bit on that? Sure. So I think the thing for our viewers to recognize here is that our tax system is much more than a mechanism of collecting revenue to fund the federal government. There is also a lot of social policy that is woven throughout the tax code in the form of the child tax credit, you know, an income tax credit. Um, and I think the thing to keep in mind with respect to fairness in taxation is anytime you are offering a tax preference to a certain group of taxpayers, inevitably you are creating a penalty for other taxpayers. Yeah. And probably one of the most popular is the home mortgage interest deduction. Yeah. So if we go back to our household A and our household B, if household A chose to purchase their home and mm -hmm. they took out a loan mm -hmm. and that loan has significant interest attached, mm -hmm. they're able to deduct that interest with respect to their tax liability. Mm -hmm. And household B may be in a similar size home, but they chose to rent that home. There is no tax benefit for renting. So you can see here that we have different situations depending upon certain behavior, preferences, and decisions that each household is making. Which is a fascinating topic that's going to fall another hour on. Exactly. But you mentioned something about revenue, so I wanted to kind of pull back on that. Um, I'm curious, can you break down a little bit about um, what are the sources for revenue for the federal government? Because I think that some people probably don't understand where the money is coming from. Sure. Yeah. So if we think of all of the revenue that is collected via taxes by mm -hmm. the federal government in terms of a pie, yeah. the individual income tax is going to make up 50% of the pie. Mm -hmm. And usually mm -hmm. this is surprising for many people because you often think the corporate income tax would be the largest source of revenue for the federal government. But in fact, it's not. The individual income tax accounts for 50% the corporate income tax a mere 7%. And if you want to look more into this, uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation does publish a report every year, mm -hmm. and it's titled Overview of the Federal Tax System. And in the appendix, they do break down federal revenue by source, okay. and you can see the different types of taxes and the proportion um, that they contribute to the federal coffers. Oh, interesting. So when 50% of your revenues depend on one particular source, it's very important how you balance that source. Absolutely. Um, now, something that's probably even more important and interesting for our audience is audits, our favorite topic, isn't it? Um, what percentage of personal income taxes get audited? Right. So the answer here is just 1% of okay. personal income taxes are generally audited by the IRS. There is a but there. Yes, <laughs> there is a but. Um, I know it's everyone's worst fear that the big bad IRS auditor is going to show up at your door and say, I want to take a closer look at your personal income tax return. Right. Um, but the good news is for most Americans, their tax returns are fairly straightforward. The majority of their income is coming from wages or salaries, and that income is subject to mandatory withholding by their employer, and so they have a rather simple return in mm -hmm. the eyes of the IRS. Mm -hmm. Now, the IRS is going to use a secret code, which is called the DIF formula, which stands for the Discriminant Index Formula, okay. in order to determine the 1% of returns that get audited. So what I'm saying here is it's not random. It's not <laughs> that they look at 100 returns and randomly pick out one to get audited they will flag the returns that are high risk. And this secret code, the DIF formula, is the mechanism they use to identify returns with high risk. Mm -hmm. So if you think of a self-employed individual, they are not subject to mandatory withholding. They are supposed to pay into the system through estimated quarterly payments, yeah. which they may or may not do. Yeah. And all year long, they're making judgment calls with respect to personal expenses or business expenses. And many of them are practicing out of their home. Yeah. So they have a home office deduction. All of these things add complexity to the return of a self-employed individual. And they would be much more likely to get audited than our individual who is simply earning wage or salary income from one business subject to mandatory withholding. Interesting. So now you have it. Yes. Yeah. And I should mention one yeah. more thing here, and yeah. that technology has really helped the IRS become more okay. efficient with respect to their audit process. Okay. So they use computer matching to look at discrepancies on returns as well. Okay. So if you're familiar with Form 1099s for your dividends or right. interest or miscellaneous income, that's information reporting 
that is occurring from the employer or financial institution that's being sent directly to the IRS. And the IRS is going to look and see if your interest, dividend, or miscellaneous income matches what these institutions have provided to the IRS. And where there's a discrepancy, that would be another red flag where those returns would get moved into a special bucket or a special file and be more likely to be subject to audit. Great. No, thank you. Now, I actually want to dive into the topic that you feel most passionate about, which is international tax. Um, I also hear often people say that the Americans um, pay too much tax, um, that obviously our system is very complex, but let's compare ourselves to the rest of the world. What does that look like? And, and where would you put us in terms of tax burden? Um, let's leave complexity aside, but let's talk about tax burden. How do we compare to the rest of the world? And I think this is a great question because it's always good to look beyond our borders and right. see how we compare on a global basis. Yeah. And when we look beyond our borders and we measure tax relative to GDP, which is an economic measure of our overall output yeah. in a year, you see that the United States actually collects less tax mm -hmm. than the OECD countries that have comprehensive tax systems. And where we fall is very low on the list. So the OECD stands for the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, and there are 35 member countries of which the United States is one. And if we are ranking taxes as far as which countries collect the most tax, mm -hmm. we're at the bottom of the list. So this is where you want to be at the bottom, not at the top. <laughs> and we rank 30th out of 35. So we are very low mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the overall taxes we collect. And to put some numbers to that, if we look at taxes at the federal, state, and local level, mm -hmm. we collect about 26%. Okay. And the countries at the top of the list, Denmark and France, they're collecting over 45% tax from their citizens. So that gives you a benchmark. If we look at the OECD average, they're at about 34%. Okay. So we're a full 8% below the other OECD member countries on average. And the this really begs the question, why are we so much lower? What is so different with respect to the United States tax system relative to other OECD member countries? Right. And the answer is, we do not impose a national consumption tax. So if you've been traveling throughout Europe or other places around the globe, you're probably familiar with something called the VAT. And that is a national consumption tax for many European it's countries. Value-added tax, right? Value-added tax. Right. Uh, there's also a value-added tax in Australia. It's called the GST. So right. it may have a different name, yeah. but most other OECD countries are imposing a national consumption tax. And we talked about consumption taxes earlier, but they are imposed here on the state and local level. They're not imposed at the national level. And so this largely accounts for our taxes being lower than most other OECD member countries on average. Excellent. Well, I think that's all we had prepared for today. So I wanted to see if we had any questions from our audience. Yes. Excellent. Um, we have a comment. Hi, Professor Fisher. You mean if two people earn the same revenue, but as one of them choose rent house and another one choose to buy a house, will they suffer from different taxes? So I think what they're asking is if um, two people earn the same income, but one of them chooses to rent and one of them chooses to buy, will they suffer from the same taxation rate? Right, so great question. And the answer is they will pay a different amount of tax because the household that chose to buy the home and take out a loan and thus incur interest on the loan will get a deduction with respect to that interest that is tied to their mortgage, whereas the household that chose to rent their home will not receive a tax benefit. So yes, this is an example of many different policies being woven through our tax system um, that are not going to simply look at raising revenue for the federal government, but instead encouraging or discouraging certain behaviors. And we could extrapolate on that and we could also look at the child tax credit. So we could take these two households and we could say that one household chooses to spend their money on having children and they derive a great amount of joy from having children. And so they have several children, and we know that that is expensive. So the federal government is going to offer them a child tax credit. Now you could look at another household, and they have chosen not to have children, but instead they derive joy from traveling the globe and taking expensive vacations. In this case, it's still very expensive, but 
the tax code is not going to offer any preference or tax benefit with respect to traveling the globe and taking expensive vacations. So this is an area where social policy is woven in with our tax policy, and you are going to get different results based upon the decisions made within each household. Um, several people are commenting that they're shocked that um, people are taxed at 50% uh, from individual incomes, and then there's a 7% corporate tax. <laughs> oh, okay, let's clear that up. That's not correct. Okay. So what we're saying is if we think of all of the revenue that the federal government collects with respect to total receipts, what we're saying is the portion of revenue that comes from individual income taxes accounts for 50% of federal receipts. So we're saying if you look at how the government fills their coffer, 50% is coming from the personal income tax, 7% is coming from the corporate income tax, and then we can add here that there's about 35% coming from social insurance taxes. And then what's left is your excise tax, your estate and gift tax, and other miscellaneous taxes. And they account for just a small portion of the pie. So those are not the rates at which we are collecting tax. That is the portion of tax relative to overall federal gross receipts that are being collected by the government to fill its coffers and fund our government programs. Any other questions? Um, yes, um, we have a question where they're asking um, if, indi if individuals that are self-employed are more liable to audits, how are cash transactions audited? And um, if they're performing contracts and are able to withhold that information. Okay, so I am not an IRS auditor, in full disclosure, um, but with respect to self-employed individuals, what I can comment on there is you do have to keep detailed records of your business expenses and any other deductions that you are taking, because if you are audited, and there definitely is a higher rate of audit with respect to self-employed individuals than the individual we described earlier who is simply earning income um, based upon you know, their employment that is subject to mandatory withholding. And those self-employed individuals will have to provide documentation to verify expenses and deductions with respect to their overall tax liability should they get an inquiry from the IRS. Okay, and then we have one last comment um, saying that they found it interesting that the complexity of tax would translate um, into being fair. And they cited the example of the horizontal fairness with two households that have the same income but different circumstances. Right, and I think that's probably a good place for us to conclude and just thinking about the takeaway here in um, the tax system. If you think about the scales of justice, on one side you have fairness, on the other side you have simplicity when it comes to taxes. So the two things that policymakers are constantly trying to balance is we want to have a simple system that doesn't interfere too much with economic efficiency and we want it to be easy for the IRS to administer and at the same time we know that there are places where we do have to consider fairness with respect to vertical equity and the ability to pay and hardships that may fall on one household over another that we can try to fine-tune through the tax code. And so this is the constant challenge and it's the ongoing debate. Uh, and this is why personally I find tax policy so interesting and why I'm so passionate about it. It's always changing um, and it's always a good topic of conversation. And so should you appreciate it. <laughs> At least that's what we think. Thank you so much for joining us today. We had a great time with Professor Fisher and we thank you so much for giving us so many great insights on tax. Um, an underappreciated but very fascinating topic. <laughs> thank you guys. Uh, we'll see you next month.